Good afternoon. I am Dory Hunstall, Associate Professor of Design and Anthropology and Associate Dean of Learning and Teaching at Swinburne University, Faculty of Design. Um, but I am speaking to you on behalf of the U.S. National Design Policy Initiative as um, I am the organizer of this um, great effort to bring design policy to the U.S. Um, if you are watching this, it means that we've experienced some technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, and thus, you're getting a pre-recorded message of what I was hoping to be able to present to you live via Skype. Um, but um, I hope to speak to you about two particular things. One is the framework for design policy um, that we've engaged with in the U.S. Um, as a way to speak to um, the business community and the government community about where design policy um, fits within their activities and can help support and enhance what it is that they do. Secondly, I'd like to speak um, about how to approach this from what we consider a design anthropology perspective, um, a way to engage um, values, um, design, and people's experiences um, to make design policy really something that has a great value to their everyday lives. Um, so to talk about the framework of design anthropology. So, um, in the U.S. National Design Policy Initiative, we, before we embarked in 2009, we actually had done substantial review of existing design policies. And we realized that design policy um, had, comes in kind of what we consider two major um, categories. Um, the first is sort of economic competitiveness. Um, and this is often the um, classical way in which um, design policies are constructed. Um, in terms of figuring out how to build up your, um, um, your economic competitiveness, especially um, in a global market. Um, but we also realize that what's important is what uh, we call design policy for democratic governance, um, meaning that design plays a significant role in understanding how a nation engages with its um, citizens and its visitors um, and its um, residents. And um, that should just be equally, um, if not of greater importance, um, as um, sort of the externally facing um, economic competitiveness. Um, but within economic competitiveness, we look at two areas, design promotion. And these are some of the things that in Iceland you've already begun to establish. Um, so the establishment of design centers, development of publications, the uh, design shop in which you can buy the great sort of design of the national designers, competitions and exhibitions to be able to again promote um, what is considered um, a national design. There's also um, a lot going on around innovation policy, so sort of design innovation as it relates to research and development, um, intellectual property and government procurement. Um, as well as what we consider human innovation, so the support um, that goes on for small and medium enterprises, large enterprises, um, higher ed um, sector, as well as kind of industry professional development or professional training. Um, within economic competitiveness, of course, um, different communities have different roles to play. So the design community, at least in the United States, um, is very strong in terms of its um, design promotion. Um, there are some government um, participation in comp uh, competitions and exhibitions. Um, there are a couple of national design museums, um, but for the most part, a lot of the um, private um, professional um, organizations and association for design carry on sort of design centers and publications and shops, communications, and all of the major activities around design promotion. So one of the things you want to need to figure out is what role does business play in design promotion? So again, a lot of our great um, businesses are in the forefront of um, showing the value of design um, as it relates to their business and allowing um, industry and associations um, to capitalize that um, as it travels globally. Um, so, um, and then in terms of innovation policy, again, that the government plays a very strong role in design innovation. So how can we build up the capacity for research and development and understanding in particular the role of design in research and development? 
Um, of course, the um, protection of intellectual property, that it's government regulations and processes that define that. Um, and then, of course, government um, is very much engaged with um, procurement. Um, in the United States, at least, the U.S. government is the largest purchasers of um, design services. And so much of the effort um, that has been done by organizations like the General Service Administration, uh, which is the sort of great procurement engine for the American government, um, has been around ensuring that the practices of procurement um, um, results in the best quality um, uh, results um, for, again, the, the most effective price for the government because they have to build things and buy things um, at large scale. Um, again, in terms of um, small, medium enterprise, large enterprise, higher ed and industry, sort of human innovation, the sort of educational aspect of it, um, this is an important role for both business and um, industry, um, business industry as well as government to get engaged, particularly in partnership with universities. Um, one of the things that I think Europe does particularly well is establish these tripart sort of innovation capabilities that combine university, government, and industry um, in such a way to really maximize the value of any innovation that comes on in terms of developing the next generation to be able to push forward the um, innovative ideals to make sure that it's connected with industry issues and industry problems as well as the government being able to leverage um, um, the scale um, by their participation in these process. Um, in terms of design for democratic governance, and I'll sort of move over on this side, but um, again, the two areas that we focus on are design standards and what we call policy as design. Design standards is really um, the significant role that government can play in developing um, policy that allows for the inclusion of safety, sustainability, um, inclusion um, in terms of language and culture, um, as well as quality into um, all aspects of design that is produced by a nation. And sometimes the design community gets a little um, nervous about the idea of standards, but again, you know, when you're talking about standards for safety, sustainability, and inclusion, um, these are things that um, should be part of any process, and it's not about aesthetics, it's making sure that design doesn't maim or kill anyone, that it adheres to policies of sustainability so it doesn't hurt or maim um, the environment, and, and again, an inclusion that everyone is able to participate in these processes. The most controversial, of course, is issues of quality, and what the role that government can play with that, as I expressed before, is that um, that policy can help you figure out what are processes to ensure that the outcomes of any design um, proposal or um, art results in a quality, um, an evaluation based on quality and not an evaluation just based on price. Um, and of course, the, the, the industry has an important role in terms of, again, um, making sure that their practices align with these standards. And what becomes really interesting is that these become drivers for potentially innovation, um, where um, you know, policies of inclusion may actually help reveal what are new markets um, for a particular um, product, service, or environment. Um, uh, sustainability, of course, has driven lots of innovation in terms of manufacturing processes, materials, all these things that are really important. So I think it's important to think of the business community to not to see sort of design standards as sort of constraints or restrictions, but actually real true opportunities to innovate and develop a competitive advantage. The last area is policy as design, and this is really um, an underexplored role in, in terms of what design, the role that design plays in how policy is created. Um, so what are the um, opportunities, let's say, for um, um, people-centered innovation in government policy? What are the ways in which um, people can sort of crowd, the government can kind of crowdsource ideas about what policies are important um, and how they should be implemented. 
Um, design plays an important role of understanding the issues. Um, so how is it that we come to deal with the complexity of a policy situation and how is it that design can be used to help correctly frame an issue so that we can um, um, help the citizens to be able to make better decisions. Um, and then in terms of engaging in the wider social context. So design plays a particular role in terms of helping us understand what are all the possibilities and not in just narrow sort of linear ways but open up um, to a range of, of s potential solutions um, and not just framing what the problems are. And so this is really an underexplored area but for me I think the most exciting area to really bring design into the living body, I would say, of an organization or the living body of a, um, of a government agency. Um, so these are the ways in which we have framed um, design policy and what this has allowed for is again not just the focus on the economic but on the sort of, you know, the, on the domestic democratic governance side um, to understand kind of who plays a stronger role in promotion um, and to talk about, to be able to talk about, well, well where is it that the government is needed? Uh, where is it that the professional communities can actually quite lead? Um, and where is it that the business industry um, needs to be supported or engaged in terms of really helping to define what is design um, and what its value um, to a nation and to everyday people. Again, innovation policy, this is where, um, again, there's a lot of area for partnership, um, particularly, I think, with the educational sector, because a lot about um, sort of design and human innovation is figuring out how do you increase the pipeline for innovation, starting from, you know, young people, um, you know, does it start in elementary school? Does it um, go into high school? Is it something that happens in the tertiary sector in the university? And really be able to develop policies that help design engage in innovation and being able to push that forward again is really important part of the future of economic competitiveness um, not just in terms of what's going on now which is what design promotion really focuses on um, and again sort of understanding um, standards or it's just sort of the minimum requirements of what is um, necessary to keep design safe, sustainable, inclusive, and a quality process of, of gaining design so that it's not driven just by price, but driven by the quality and the skills of the designer. And policy as design as, again, an under, underexplored area of design for democratic governance, which is about the nexus of policy making and design itself as a communication tool, as an experience of, of design, um, as design values of, let's say, democracy and how people actually experience that. So this leads me kind of to a, um, the last part of um, my discussion um, in terms of um, where I think particularly um, in an Icelandic context it needs to um, the design policy can be engaged and this is where it's important to talk about it from a design anthropological perspective because um, again I, my primary work has been in the United States but now for the past two years I've lived in Australia and I have lots of conversations with the Australian um, Design Alliance which is also looking at um, what role does design policy play in Australia and in that process it's been really important to understand the sort of um, particularity of the national issues that drive design policy. So culture space, um, a culture, cultural based understanding of those things is really important um, to defining what should be the terrain for an as, um, Icelandic um, design policy. Um, so one of the things that we always talk about, um, at least in my work, is uh, a design anthropology sort of approach to things. And that means really trying to understand um, this statement of sort of um, design translates 
values into tangible experiences. Um, so from a design, um, design um, anthropology perspective, we try to understand values. We try to understand the process of sort of design translation. And then we try to understand what it is that people are actually experiencing. And so when you're thinking about the design of a design policy, it's really important to say what are the values Um, important in this landed context because that then should drive um, how how all of these different sort of policy instruments that one has you know you have taxes you have um, committees you have um, you have direct funding um, you have um, uh, sort of bonuses, you have all these sort of different sort of instruments that can be used to translate whatever these values are into experiences that directly affect um, the design community, expect the everyday citizen, as well as government agencies, and the business community. Um, and it's really important to think about this as a design engagement. So how do you sort of, what's your first iterations of things that you would create? How do you gather feedback from um, those who are supposed to experience um, whatever these, the values are? Um, how do you um, gain feedback and then let, um, prepare the next iteration um, for the next group? Um, and I think from a sort of perspective of, of, of design anthropology, it really is important to spend the first, a lot of time, um, first defining what are the key values um, that are really important um, from a national perspective. And, um, and these don't have to be um, necessarily um, aesthetic values, but where, um, where culture um, has a very strong role to play in how design is formed and thus the policy that supports that are normally the places that have been had really successful design policies. And I think of um, Japan as one of the examples where they have a very well-defined sense of what are sort of Japanese values, um, that it's their design policy has been um, set up to actually support that. Um, and thus, they've been very successful in terms of engaging with um, what is Japanese design and what competitive advantage it can provide, but also what, what advantages or value add that it provides for the um, Japanese people. Um, so I think um, with that, I think that's the end of my presentation. And I look forward to um, discussing further with you uh, when I meet you at 4 o'clock your time, which I think is will be 2 AM my time, um, to discuss with you via Skype um, some of the issues that I've um, raised in my presentation. So to conclude, um, again, thinking about design policy um, within the broader field of design policy for economic competitiveness, but also design policy for democratic governance, and within design policy for um, economic competitiveness, realize what is the role of government and business and the design communities in design promotion, and then innovation policy. Because oftentimes, again, every um, um, each stakeholder has a different role to play and what you want to be able to find is those areas of, of overlap so that you can scale the positive impact of anything that you seek to do. In terms of design policy for democratic governance, again focus on design standards as again the minimum requirements um, to make sure that design is naturally safe, sustainable, inclusive of all the people's um, and again, that the process by which a design happens is based on one of the overall quality and not just the lowest price. 
And um, again, design policy for, um, in terms of policy as design, is really understand clearly what is the role of design in, in helping to inform, engage, and engage um, the citizens and residents of a nation in its own process of um, further democracy and further um, inclusion. Um, and again, doing it from a process of first understanding what are the values, in this case important Icelandic values, um, how sort of design can translate that through the use of different policy instruments, um, and then also making sure that there's lots of mechanism for feedback from everyday people about whether or not they're experiencing those values um, in the way in which they've been intentionally set up and designed. So um, thank you and see you at 2 a.m. my time, um, 4 p.m. your time.